Welcome to Grand Prix Portland Round 11 coverage. There you see Christian Keith with Jun Delirium on your left. And there you see Chris Botello playing Cat Packed uh, there on the right. Cat Packed being a deck that uses Demonic Pact and Harmless Offering to defeat their opponent. Oh, that cute little cat on the picture. That cute little cat. Have you looked at that cat's tail? <laughs> that cat's tail is vicious. Uh, th this is a scary matchup, I think, for a, for a pack deck if, uh, if there's Emrakul's uh, in his future. I don't know if this is yeah. straight delirium, but you do not want to have a pack in play when your opponent's taking your turn. Nope. Yeah, because there's one uh, particular mode on that demonic pack <laughs> that is going to be quite harmful to you if your opponent gets to pick what you're, what you're choosing. All right, so we see uh, Christian Keith leading things off here with a Vessel of Nascency. He sees an Ishkana, a couple of lands, and another Vessel. And it looks like he's taken the Vessel. Yeah, and if, if I'm not mistaken, I think Chris was on the play and actually missed his third land drop here, so that's not a great sign if that's the case. <laughs> um, you asked me about my, my pre-Pro Tour traditions, and one of them was packing my cards. That's the first thing I always do. The second thing I always do is build a demonic pack deck. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've tried just about everything, and, and I've never been able to quite get it to work. Though I have to say that this time, the, the demonic pack that, deck that I built was uh, Mardu Colors, and I didn't actually try Grixis. Maybe Chris is onto something here. Yeah. So you pack, and then you packed? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So third land for uh, for Christian here. I'm not sure. Looks like he's might be talking to a judge or asking a question. So the front card in Chris Patello's hand is a card I love out of this out of this deck. It's Oath of Chandra. Now sort of an unassuming card. Um, you know, sorcery speed three damage to a creature. Not that impressive. But what it does is is it protects your demonic packs from Dramokas command. Gives you a buffer. Oh, that's you, nice. You know, by the time Oath of Chandra's in play, it's already done its main job, so you don't mind at all if you have to sacrifice that uh, to the sacrifice and enchantment mode of Dramokas Command. Well, it looks like we're not going to get to see Chris Patel do much here in game one. He's passed the turn again. You see him discarding Radiant Flames there to hand size. And a fourth land for Christian Keith. Well, if it turns out that, that Chris is not able to find his third and fourth land in this game, the one saving grace of that is that Christian Keith's going to be in, in for a surprise after sideboarding. <laughs> he's, he's thinking, oh, okay, you know, Grixis colored lands, Radiant Flames, I think I know what's up here, just the Grixis control deck. No, there's a little more to it than that. And that's, and that's what you would put your opponent on here if you were sitting across from him and he's just discarding that card? Yeah, I would think, okay, this is the old-fashioned Goblin Dark Dwellers Grixis deck that people liked against Bant Company in the old format, but Chris has a few more tricks up his sleeve. All right, here comes Nissa Vestwood Seer. Just steadily progressing his board, building out his graveyard. His Make Metallica Great Again hat. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> All right, there's a swamp for Chris Patello. It's good news. And so, but uh, nothing, no play for him here. No, I'm actually a little surprised to, s to see him not use the Oath of Chandra to kill Nyssa. Is he sitting, does he have some sort of counter magic that he might be sitting on? No, I saw him with a Disperse in his hand, which is a card that makes sense with a Demonic Pact game plan. You can use a couple modes on Demonic Pact, then bounce it back to your hand. Resetting it is even better than having to spend a, uh, a removal spell on your own card. All right, here we see Mindrack Demon now from Christian Keith. This is a card that a lot of the decks that were trying to do Delirium pre-Eldritch Moon were, were playing. There you get a look at it. Flying Trample, when it enters the battlefield, you mill four cards. Just does everything you want, right? Yeah, so this, when you first look at it, you think, okay, four mana, four, five flying with a, with a bit of a scary drawback. Not the case in these Delirium decks. That is definitely upside to be able to mill the top four cards of your library, and you're, you almost always have Delirium by that point anyway. Uh, Demonic Pact has hit the board here for Chris Botello. 
And there you see putting <laughs> lots of dice in all sorts of places so yeah. he can remember all the things he needs to do on his upkeep. Yeah, you can tell that Chris has a system for, for managing <laughs> this card. So really what you want to do now is use the three good modes here and then maybe bounce the demonic pack back to your hand. Yeah, exactly. So I, I love this card because it just gives you so many options, and especially in a game like this where... Botello finds himself behind, he has, to, he has to choose which modes are going to catch him up most quickly. He can use the draw two cards to find his land drops. He can use the uh, War Leader's Helix mode to... Which is, which is what he did to the Nissa here. Yep, to manage the board and to protect his life total. So and he goes up to 16, and now he's taken another hit from Mind Rack Demon. And then the third mode is to mind route the opponent. The normal play pattern with that one, I think, is that you're going to use it last when your opponent is, is lower on cards, or you can set up a big turn where you use two mind routes in the same turn to just clean them out. And I wonder if that's what he's doing right here. Yeah. Or is he drawing four cards? He's going to just draw the two from the first. And now he is in full harmless offering mode here. He's just looking to get. Yeah, I guess that's what he's looking for. We're going to see a third demonic pact. <laughs> we got three demonic pacts in play. Okay, so it looks like in his upkeep, he used one of the demonic packs to draw two cards. One, one of the demonic packs to deal four damage to the demon and then finished it off with Oath of Chandra. Very nice. Yeah, so I was skeptical <laughs> way back on turn three when he didn't use the Oath of Chandra, <laughs> but Chris had, had planned this out way in advance. I like it. So all he's doing right now is going, please, no Emrakul. Yeah. Please, no Emrakul, because your opponent controls your turn. They're just going to choose to have you lose the game. And Christian Keith must be thinking, boy, where did this go wrong? The board looked a lot better for me a few turns ago. All right, here comes Nissa. Gets fl fl grows it back with Liliana's ability. Minus two. Goes and gets a forest. He's got seven cards. Now, and really, his cards, his cards are dead against Chris Botello. He's holding a Languish. He's holding uh, Fiery Impulse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as, as you mentioned, this game has quickly come down to Emrakul or Bust, I think. Yeah, you see Nissa Sage Animist uh, flip over a Evolving Wild, which Christian just immediately cracks. So we're getting down to one ability left on that first uh, Demonic Pack. We do know he has a Disperse, though. We, we saw that earlier in hand. And Christian Keith is discarding to hand size now. Oh, no, he, I'm sorry. He was discarding to, to the, the ability. Yeah, the mind route. Okay, we're, 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 we're stripping apart his hand. I got it. And I think if Patello finds Harmless Offering here, that's going to be game over, right? Uh, ah, yeah. <laughs> if, if you, ha you, can't, you can't start your turn with that demonic pact in play with one ability there's no opportunity to respond to it right right yeah that's right the trigger will go on the stack no matter what i see a red card wow meow <laughs> <laughs> there is the harmless offering take this demonic pact make good use of it <laughs> and target opponent gains control of target permanent you control there you have it Demonic Pact has only one option left on it. You lose the game yeah. is what Chris Botello tells Christian Key. Christian Key is like, really? Did this just happen to me at 9-1? and one? Is there anything I can do? No, there's nothing you can do. Botello should, should pass that slip of paper across the table, too, just to <laughs> remind him, yeah, these three modes are already used. Your options are limited. <laughs> and now, now he has to appreciate it. Great sportsmanship there from Chris. He's like, okay, all right, now I see what's happening. <laughs> Chris has probably had that look on his face all weekend. 
every time he gets to play that card. Wow, that was great. He, yeah. and he missed two land drops. Yeah, that game was looking as bad as it could have looked for Chris Patel in the early turns, but then his deck did exactly what it's supposed to do. Demonic Pact, extremely powerful card when you get to actually stick it in play. Yeah, and then and you just saw all the things he was able to do. He's able to clean up the board. He's able to dig for cards. He's able to strip his opponent's hand. Uh, meanwhile, we're going to check in on Cody Lingelbach uh, playing blue-green Crush. So this is a Crush of Tentacles deck against Andrew Solano uh, with black-green mid-range. So Cody Lingelbach had back-to-back uh, -back top eights in one of the previous standard formats, and both with different brews. He had a a Mardu Thopters deck first, and then a uh, a Grixis Dragons Flyers deck, if I recall correctly. Yeah. yeah, pretty impressive guy being able to do so well with with his own creations. Yeah, I got a chance to spend some time with him in uh, in Spain prior to the prior to that Pro Tour, and he was a uh, very very impressive uh, young Magic player. So uh, to add to the list of cards that I never would have expected to see in Standard, <laughs> Send to Sleep in Cody Lingelbach's deck, three copies, and Sight Beyond Sight. That's the slow uh, rebound card draw spell. What? Sight Beyond Sight? Yeah, four mana sorcery. Look at the top two cards, put one in your hand. Right. Rebound again next turn. Sort of like a read the bones on, on delay. Wow, that's crazy. And then Andrew Solano playing a more traditional black-green mid-range deck. We've seen stuff like this before. And wow, he... This is actually a very old-fashioned style of list. He's still playing Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger instead of Emrakul. It, it doesn't cease. <laughs> Woodland Bellower Nissa, for Nissa Vast Woodseer or Tireless Tracker. A couple of Planeswalkers in Obnixilis and Liliana. And then just a lot of ramp removal and a little tutoring with Dark Petition. Yeah, he has one Emrakul in his sideboard. But other than that, this looks like the exact deck that Andrew Solano has been playing for a while. Black, green, sort of mid-range, sort of ramp. Uh, seasons past Dark Petition deck. Seasons passed only in his sideboard for this tournament. But. By the way, a lot of counters on that uh, Lumbering Falls. Yeah, that must be from an awakened part the Water Veil, I'm guessing. Yep, three copies of part the Water Veil in Linglebox deck. And there is Crush of Tentacles. That card, probably part of the reason that we see so many lands in play and so few non-land permanents <laughs> on both sides of the board. Draft 16. Please go to the blue gathering point for your draft to begin. Draft 16. So send to sleep locks down two of the creatures. And I wonder if that is, is Cody's main goal or whether it's just setting up the surge on Crush of Tentacles. Yeah, I think he is just setting up surge here. So there's the Crush of Tentacles. He's like, yeah, you have to pick up your Nissa too. He's like, oh, yeah, well, you have to pick up your clue. Yeah. <laughs> Get it. 8-8 eight, eight Octopus. By the way, you also have a clear board to swing in with your Lumbering Falls right now. Mm hmm Ha, <laughs> ha, uh, Andrew Solano goes to activate his Hissing Quagmire to block, and it gets immediately sent to sleep. So now Cody has the option to, he doesn't, because that's an awakened lane, he doesn't have to animate it, but if he does animate it, it becomes even bigger, right? Right, so it's going to be a 9-9 nine -nine creature when it's, when it's animated. And note that even though it is a creature at all times, Crush of Tentacles specifies non-land cards. So an animated land does not get bounced back to his hand.
Brian, in all your years of doing coverage, have you ever seen uh, octopuses be such an important tribe in, in a standard format? Uh, n outside of a commander game <laughs> af after round nine, no. I love it. <laughs> okay, Obnixilis comes down and just points right at the octopus. And you can see Cody being extremely careful to keep mana open for his Lumbering Falls at all times. This is because if if Andrew ever points a removal spell or an Obnixilis activation at Lumbering Falls, Cody can activate it in response and it'll have Hexproof. So that is Nissa, which has been returned to his hand. He just puts it on the Sage Animus side because he... Oh, wait. Does he not have... Fails to find on Fars, but he might just have another land in hand already. Mm -hmm. Yep. And suddenly he's... Uh, suddenly this game seems to maybe have swung around a little bit for him. Okay, well, this, this might be here for a while. These guys are still in game one, so I think they'll still be here when we get back. Let's go back and look at our main match. I want to see uh, some more free kittens. Yeah. Boy, we've, we've picked good decks for this <laughs> round to cover. No more Bant Company mirrors. Now we're, we're into the good stuff. I wish you guys could see Reed's face right now. The idea of a Demonic Pack deck doing well. He is very, very happy. Yeah, I know what I'm playing next tournament. <laughs> So the key cards from, from uh, Christian Keith's side of the table, I think, are going to be, of course, the Emrakul that we mentioned a few times in game one. He's going to be looking for that. And also Distended Mindbender. Uh, Mindbender oh, yeah, that card seems great. Can come down either before the Demonic Pact to make sure the Demonic Pact never hits the table, or uh, it can come down after and try to strand Chris Patella without a way to remove his own Demonic Pact. Discard spells generally... Uh, just excellent against a deck like this with so many moving parts. And there you see Transgress the Mind taking a look at Christian Keith's hand. I mean, at Chris Patello's hand. It sees a, a lot of land and infinite obliteration that a, I dark think that's petition a dark petition and an Oath of Jace. So Oath of Jace has uh, that same cool, cool effect of protecting Demonic Pact from Dramoka's Command that we mentioned in Oath of Chandra. It also helps you dig, helps you fill your graveyard. And how about that island? Yeah, that's nice. pretty. <laughs> no red mana for Botello, but also no red cards just yet. It's going to be a while before he actually needs to cast that. Wow, Christian's really in the tank here on this. That harmless offering. So what is that? Does Keith have, he had the main deck. He did have an Emrakul main deck in game one. Um, yeah, we don't have Christian Keith's deck list in front of us right oh, okay. now. But but traditionally the Jun Delirium deck, that is uh, one important part of its game plan, is getting up to the Emrakul. Wow, look at this. Christian is really agonizing here. Yeah, he knows how important Emrakul is in this matchup. It's, it's very difficult to beat the Demonic Pack deck fair and square with creatures. So if he loses his Emrakul to that infinite obliteration, it's going to limit his ways to score an easy win. Ultimately decides to obliterate the infinite obliteration. Yeah, so that's really planning for the long game here. Oh, and I think it was a good decision because he, he actually drew Emrakul this turn. <laughs> so now he gets a duress. This is just the type of hand Christian Keith wants to have. He has tons of discard spells. I think I even saw a distended Mindbender. Takes he the Oath of Jace this time. So he did have, he had one Emrakul in his, in his main list, uh, and then he has an additional one in his side. I imagine he would have brought that in. Yeah, I think so too. But now it's, it's Christian's turn. Oh, he missed no. land drops. Yeah, he, he's, he's missed his land here. And oh, look and at this, right, right on time. On time wow. After the two discard spells, finds Demonic Pact on turn four. And you see that he's not afraid to cast it because he has a Dark Petition to find an answer once he needs one. So third land for Keith. He has the Emrakul in hand, but 
he has turns and turns away, even optimistically. The most optimistic version of casting an Emrakul turns mm -hmm. away from it. But if he can start making his land drops, maybe get that distended Mindbender um, onto oh. the stack, that, that'll be a really good start for him and can delay uh, Chris Patello's game plan. Chris. So here's a dark petition with wow. no no spell mastery, but he's just going to set up next turn, make sure he has one or maybe even two ways to deal with his own demonic pack, so he's not going to lose to it. Now I know uh, a couple was talking to a couple of Portland players who were testing uh, the Grixis donate list, as they were calling it, and uh, they said that often against the Emrakul decks, you sometimes have to give them a demonic pact with a good mode to go. Hmm. You know, like you can't you can't wait until you can't wait around for them to Emrakul you while you still control a demonic pack. Yep. And if they're close to Emrakul, sometimes you just have to go like demonic pack here, take this, and you know hope that they uh, you can keep the game going long enough for them to lose. That's interesting. That's that's some pretty great forethought that I might not have uh, considered the first time I picked up this deck. So it's sorcery and land are the only two creature types in uh, in the yard there for Christian Keith right now. Mm -hmm. He picked up an Ishkana Graf Widow from the Liliana Minus. Now he's discarding two cards to uh, Demonic Pack, and he discards the Graf Widow and an Emrakul. Yeah, so that's pretty nice. I, I, <laughs> and wow. look at this. Here you go, with a good mode to go. And does Christian Keith have any way in his, in his deck to deal with that? He has one Caustic Caterpillar in the sideboard. That might be his only way to take an enchantment off the battlefield. Wow. <laughs> you got to use a mode here, and I think he, yep, he domed Chris Patello for four. Yeah, not, not going to be good enough to actually get Chris down to zero, but it at least <laughs> buys him this. one turn. Wow. Chris Patello with the demonic pack says free kittens for everybody, and he goes to 10 and one here at Grand Prix Portland with Cat Pack. Yeah, that was a really dominant showing by that deck. Excellent. Yeah, and you could tell he has played his fair share of play done his fair share of playtesting against the Emrakul deck. He said, you know what? I think you might be able to cast an Emrakul next turn. I cannot hold on to this demonic pact any longer. Yeah, also also worried about discard spells there. He doesn't oh, yeah. get his most important card uh, sniped by a transgress the mind. Meanwhile, still in game one. <laughs> still <laughs> in game one. <laughs> <laughs> blue green crush versus black green mid range and uh we see a woodland bellower into sylvan advocate and another sylvan advocate for andrew solano solano now at the very precarious life total of eight meaning <laughs> that either the octopus or the lumbering falls is going to be lethal i see a den protector in lingle box hand so if he has enough mana he can go den protector back sent to sleep oh he, he just has sent to sleep already which is going to be Good enough. Wow. Doesn't even need to bring back the crush there. Yeah, we tuned in exactly at the right time to see Cody Lingelbach finish the job that took him, you know, seemingly 25 turns to <laughs> set up. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. So there you get a look at the feature match area. You see uh, those guys still doing a little post-game analysis on the end of their of their match. He's like, I can't believe he demonic pacted me. <laughs> I think that's actually what he just said. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, you get a look at Corey Lingle back on your right, Andrew Solano on your left, and our other match in the feature match area this round, which is between...
So uh, Solano and Lingelbach have some, some commonalities between their two decks. Both players are trying to ramp at least a little bit. Uh, Lingelbach more so than Solano. Lingelbach has four copies each of Nissa's Pilgrimage and Explosive Vegetation. But Andrew Solano uh, has Nissa's Pilgrimage in his deck as well. And if he can get up to his cards like Ulamog, uh, well, Ulamog, I guess, I guess specifically, is going to be the most important one to ramp to. Emrakul, the Promised End as well. Uh, yeah, whichever player can ramp to their, their more powerful spells first is going to have a big advantage. Other than that, Andrew's going to be forced to play a little bit more of a black-green rock uh, strategy with discard spells, trying to put on pressure with his creatures, and just make sure that that's Lingelbach can't assemble his game plan. Can he can he assemble a uh, Emrakul Crush of Tentacles plan where he's bouncing his own Emrakul and taking? Oh, I certainly start? hope so. <laughs> he does have an Emrakul in his sideboard. Yeah, I think we'll see that come in for a matchup like this. Yeah, I mean, certainly. I mean, he could have just cast it for 13 that game. <laughs> like, yeah, he, he sure could have cast it with an empty graveyard. I mean, I, C Cody should think about it. <laughs> so we haven't seen this uh, too much of this blue-green Crush of Tentacles deck, but Linglebuck's doing excellent in the tournament. 8-1-1 eight, one, and one so far. Um, his deck features... Small number of creatures that are pretty good to be bouncing back to your hand and replaying. Elvish Visionary, Den Protector, Nissa Vastwood Seer, and he's ramping towards big plays like Ulamog, like Partha Watervale. He's smoothing his draws with some card drawing like that Sight Beyond Sight that we mentioned. So we have an Ulamog mirror match. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ulamog, a card that has gotten nearly forgotten in the wake of Emrakul being so popular, but Ulamog still wins you the game when you cast him. So here's a duress. It sees a handful of crush, anticipate, explosive vegetation, summary dismissal, a card that has gone sh rocketed up in uh, utility, and uh, three lands. Takes the explosive vegetation out. Yeah, and that's a, a pretty common and important part of the Black Green Deck's game plan you, the only the only tool you have to actually fight the opponent's ramp spells is your discard. So, a lot of times you need to use duress to take out explosive vegetation, and you need to use your other tools to neutralize the other the other plays the opponent has. And now here comes a transgress the mind. We see that Cody has picked up a death miss raptor, and uh, that gets exiled. So that's about as good as. Uh, it gets dealing with a death, death miss raptor. Yep. So here's an anticipate from Cody at the end of the turn. Two death miss raptors in Cody's sideboard. I guess they're there uh, both for matchups where the opponent's attacking on the ground and for grindy matchups like this where you know the game's going to go long. It looks like Cody anticipated into a Nissa's pilgrimage here. Wow, that's perfect. Exactly what he wants. And he was ab even able to protect it from discard spells because, of course, uh, transgress the mind can't take away anticipate and there you see he also had spell mastery able to get uh, three lands out of his deck with that one in play Ooh, two not in not a great turn for solano here oh just hissing quagmire you mm -hmm. now i'm not sure if solano drew transgress the mind on turn two but things would have broken a lot better for him if he was able to take the anticipate with the duress and then transgress the explosive vegetation that would have uh, hurt Cody's chances of finding the Nissa's Pilgrimage. It also would have perhaps not allowed him to have Spell Mastery when he cast it. Looks like a distended Mindbender. Oh, no, it's another Transgress. And uh, Cody thought about for a second about Summary Dismissal. He said, well, you're probably just going to take that out of my hand anyway. So. Yeah, I wonder why he would not cast summary dismissal there. I don't know. Maybe see what it see. Give his opponent a chance to not take it. Maybe. And here's a death mist raptor. So he, he did side in both, and it's going to be taken out with grasp of darkness. Yeah, not much going on here. Uh, he does have a dark petition in hand. 
he's just he's just going in with the hiss and quagmire again. So he's clearly thinking about in the long term what that dark petition can get him. His most powerful cards are Ulamog, Emrakul. He has a Gaia's Revenge in his sideboard, which I wouldn't be surprised if he if he brought in for a matchup like this. And then of course he has Seasons Past, so oh. he can start that that loop going if you would like. Both both players are not really doing anything here. Mungo back just uh, getting in with his Lumber and Falls. Yeah, so Linglebox Hand uh, just lands in Crush of Tentacles right now, which no non-land permanents on either side of the battlefield <laughs> to, to be bouncing. There's an Evolving Wild from Solano. No attack. She picked up another island for Linglebox. Linglebox gets in with the Lumbering Falls. And he's willing to trade creature lands here because... He has two creature lands to Solano's one, and he just has plenty of lands in hand. He's not worried about his mana development at yeah. this point. So Hissing Quagmire death touches the Lumbering Falls. Yep, a fair trade. And Cody Lingobach plays a, another land, still has seven even after losing that one, and says go. So Andrew's starting to size things up for, oh, here's Read the Bones. That's a nice draw here. Yeah. He just wants to be careful with, with which lands he chooses to, to use the, the Read the Bones. And here it is. Just scry two, draw two. Okay. I think he'll put the Nissus Pilgrimage on top and look for another card. So this way he can he can ramp towards using Dark Petition for one of those big expensive cards that, that we talked about earlier. Get, getting close to Ulamog here. Yeah, getting close to Ulamog, getting close to Emrakul. This will also give him the ability to cast Dark Petition and Seasons Past in the same turn with the Spell Mastery. In comes Lumbering Falls. Oh, he just plays another land. See the downside of the crush deck when yeah. you draw all your crushes. He has a very reactive hand, and it does mean that he has uh, tools to delay Andrew Solano. If if Andrew is on, you know, Sylvan Advocates, Woodland Bellowers, Ishkana Graph Widows, then those crush tentacles are going to be very good. But I think Andrew has constructed his deck in such a way that he can bypass all that uh, mid-range stuff and just go straight for the end game. Okay, so he dark petitions for Woodland Bellower, plays Woodland Bellower, and uh, digs out a tireless tracker here. Plays yeah. land and gets a clue. I'm not thrilled about this plan in the face of the, the Crush of Tentacles that he knows about from earlier discard spells. Uh... I would be more inclined to just go straight for one of the Eldrazi Titans here. But the good news is Tireless Tracker in a protracted game like this is one of the best cards you can have access to. Even if it gets bounced repeatedly, he can still just keep replaying it, making a clue. He has tons of mana to crack those clues. So he'll be able to find more action. But look at this. Co Cody Lingleback's able to go Explosive Vegetation into a surged Crush of Tentacles, makes an Octopus, and says go. So that sets Solano back. It also puts the 8-8. Oh. oh, wow. Ulamog gets to take Very out nice. an octopus and a lumbering falls. Oh, you know, a possibility that, that I actually oh, no, had not considered. Oh, no, it takes out two lands. It's possible that Solano uh, dark petitioned for something else like that Ulamog and just had, had uh, Woodland Bellower in hand to use the mana on. Oh, okay. Perhaps I spoke too soon in criticizing his play. Or already had the Ulamog. Yeah, that's, that could be possible as well. All right. So Nissa comes down, transforms into the Sage Animist. And what is Cody going to do about Ulamog? Finds yeah. a Nissa's Pilgrimage off of the plus one. Crush of Tentacles <laughs> is definitely not the answer you want to Ulamog. <laughs> Send to Sleep no. is, is pretty good, but the, the presence of Ulamog on the battlefield is actually in a, 
effectively turn off Crush of Tentacles for the rest of the game for Cody because he doesn't want to let that Ulamog go back to Solano's hand just to exile two more permanents. And still can manage to get three lands out of his deck. The advantage of playing the two color deck with all the basics. Yeah. You see, sometimes people get that second Nissus pilgrimage and they're like, I don't have <laughs> enough forests anymore. Certainly in a game like this where it's just a contest of who can play the more powerful spells, you, you want to have that large number of basic forests. So I think we're going to see... Andrew's down to four here, so he has to be very wary. Yeah, so he's thrilled to have been able to take out that Lumbering Falls. Now there's actually not that much hasted damage that Cody can produce in his deck. So here goes Big turn. Path. Yeah. Killing both of Cody's yep. non-land non permanents. And kills this is Sage Animist. And uh, if Cody wants to crush here, I think Andrew's pretty happy with it. Yep. Ulamog gets to untap. And we might actually see Lingelbach concede here rather than reveal the 20 cards off of Ulamog. Gets another clue, goes to his attack step, and yep. that is exactly what happens. He might have also just been dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was in 16. Mm -hmm. If Solano cracked some clues to Tyler's tracker, that he could have he could have made 16 damage there. Wow. All right, so we're gonna see a game three between these. Uh, ceaseless Hunger decks. Yes, sweet decks. Fascinating. I mean, the, the early turns of that game were so weird, where they're both just sort of cracking back with, with uh, creature lands, and, uh, you know, Andrew's just taking apart Cody's hand. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and his Crush of Tentacles didn't look great in that game, where there was just one big, powerful creature that Andrew sort of sculpted his turns towards. Yeah, so... Lingelbach had those two Crush of Tentacles stuck in his hand for much of the game, and they ended up just not being an effective answer to the enters the battlefield triggers of, of Andrew Solano's deck. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we talked about how Cody builds his deck so that all of his creatures get, you know, are great with Crush of Tentacles, but, you know, the ones in, in Andrew's deck are, are pretty good, too. Yep, absolutely. You know, I mean, the Tireless Tracker and the Sylvan Advocate get a little annoyed, right? They're like, oh, come on, really? But Nissa Vast would see her. Ulamog and Woodland Bellower are all uh, all great cards to replay, as is, you know, Emrakul if that came in. Now we're taking a look at the undefeated match here. So this is JC Tao and Zin, uh, Jin Sui. Four color amalgam versus Abzan Control. Wow. Soren doing some work here. And Zinsui is up a game, um, but thankfully JC gets a lot of extra tools off the sideboard and more discard spells, infinite obliteration. So sends his team at Soren. Soren goes down to one. Here comes Jace Vrin's prodigy. Zin wants a uh, planeswalker as well. Reveals a swamp off of Soren. Lines up his lands. Looks like he has a Gideon, ally of Zendikar in hand. He does. Plays it. Makes a knight. Wow, those guys, I guess, didn't do a lot of sideboarding for game three because they are already underway. Let's go back to that match and watch Cody Lingleback versus Andrew Solano. So here's a Deathmiss Raptor on turn three for Cody. He gets to come out of the gates a little quicker in this game. He's on the play, so. Mm -hmm. And there's Tireless Tracker. So this is a, a little bit more of a traditional game of Magic. Lingelbach has a cool card in play there. It's, uh, I actually can't place the name of the, but it's the land from Battle for Zendikar that keeps a creature tapped. <laughs> There's Anissa's Pilgrimage, just gets two lands, no no spells, much less spell mastery in his graveyard when he casts it. 
So funny enough, uh, in a lot of ways, Linglebox deck is plays like a combo deck. He's looking to ramp his mana and set up for big turns with Crush with Tentacles and part the Water Veil. However, the, this little incidental damage that he can get in in the early turns with Death Mist Raptor and Lumbering Falls actually makes a big difference because we've seen in, in the two previous games him threaten big turns with Send to Sleep where he just needs to get through one creature to deal the last little bit of damage. Skyline Cascade, the land in play. Tireless Tracker versus Deathmiss Raptor. In comes the Raptor. Tra Tracker just steps in the way. And nothing brewing here for Cody. Yeah, it looks like Solano has a pretty powerful hand and just wants to protect his life total and make sure things don't go, go he, too wrong. So he's going to transgress. And now we're going to see Cody use the summary dismissal to counter that. Yeah, I think that's wise. That puts an instant in his graveyard for the purposes of spell mastery, protects the information of Solano seeing his hand. And Nissa Vastford Seer is the follow up for Solano. See the players using the checklist cards a lot here this weekend. There's an Elvish Visionary. Ooh, and he drew Sight Beyond Sight. It's at one of the perfect the cards for this for this turn. And there he is. He's casting Sight Beyond Sight. <laughs> Solana says, what, what the <laughs> is this? <laughs> we'll see if we can get that card up for you. So there you see, he's just leaving it there. It's got, re it's got rebound. In comes Nissa. You guys see two Obnixilis in Andrew Solano's hand, which is not great at killing Elvish Visionaries, but it is great at drawing cards and making sure the gas keeps flowing. Yep. Standard three. Actually decides to sack a clue Standard instead of playing Obnixilis. Standard three. And hits transgress the mind. He's like, what were you protecting so hard there? Yeah, part the water veil he takes almost immediately. He knows that that's not a card he wants to face. So Cody gets to go digging for some new cards here. Found a den protector, which can not only get back his, his best card, whether that's Summary Dismissal or Sight Beyond Flight, but it's also going to bring back Death Miss Raptor along the way. Yeah, and that's what he does. So here comes Nissa, Sage Animist on Andrew's seventh land drop. <laughs> Cody's like, oh, do you want an elemental token? No? Andrew's like, maybe. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, he's like, okay, yes, yes, I do. I agree with your analysis of this situation, Cody. Like <laughs> Ruinous, ruinous path targets the den protector. And it's going to get void shattered. Second copy of Nissa. Wow. I like this play by Andrew Solano. Um, he knows that Cody doesn't have much hard removal in his blue green deck. Uh, and he also anticipates that his his transformed Nissa Sage Animist is likely to bite the dust in the face of three opposing creatures. So uh, Den Protector turns face up, brings back Death Mist Raptor. Den Protector also brings back Summary Dismissal. Yep. So I think Linglebach 
casting Void Shatter on that turn was mostly a case of wanting to use his mana as effectively as possible and also maintain enough creatures on the battlefield to pressure Solano's Planeswalkers. So Cody's able to just send the Visionary at Sage Animus and then send the other two creatures at Andrew and drops him to seven here and his creatures are not untapping. Yeah. He might get tempoed out here. And remember, there is a Lumbering Falls back there as well. So here comes Nissa Sage Animus number two. Now, does he want to go right into another elemental token? And because his is didn't untap this turn? Yeah, so it is a legendary token. He would have to lose the tap token, but maybe. And that's what he does. Yeah, desperate times call for desperate measures. So basically just uses Nissa to untap the yep. token. And he also is using Quagmire to protect himself, so he's not in big trouble unless Lingleback can find another send to sleep. So Linglebox hand features Lumbering Falls, Summary Dismissal, Explosive Vegetation, and oh, he does have another Send to Sleep. With Counterspell Backup. <laughs> yeah, although his, his mana is a little bit constrained here. If he wants to both activate Lumbering Falls and cast Send to Sleep, he's not gonna have enough left for summary dismissal, and that's what you see him puzzling out here. He's thinking about all the possibilities, he's thinking about the timing, because if he attacks and passes priority, then Solano might just choose to block with the uh, Ashaya token right. rather than activate Hissing Quagmire. It's a little bit of a If, if he knew he was gonna activate advance. Hissing Quagmire, he would just send in the team. Yes. But Andrew's seen enough of Send to Sleep that he's not gonna do that. Mm -hmm. and, and Cody came to that conclusion and just sends in the Deathmish Raptor to trade with the token. And this is great news for Solano because he's going to get to untap with Nyssa. His life total is still really in jeopardy here against now two Lumbering Falls, but if he can find some removal spells, he might be able to stabilize the situation. Oh, Duress is a big draw here because he can take away the scent to sleep. Well, perhaps not because of summary dismissal, but if he could take away the scent to sleep, then, then his Quagmire becomes a reliable blocker again. Here's Duress. Cody says fine, which one do you want? Yeah. Uh, I don't know why he wouldn't cast summary dismissal here. Solano says, you can have the counterspell. I, I want Send to Sleep to go away. Yep. And part of that's because he has a Transgress the Mind, which can take Summary Dismissal, but not take Send to Sleep. Ah, look at that. And this turn would have played out a lot differently if, if Cody had cast Summary Dismissal on the Duress. Um, and now he casts it on, on, on Transgress. But yeah. If Solano had known exactly the two cards in hand, he, he could have sequenced the discard spells in the opposite order to still get the same result. There is, oh wow. Oh, the Nissa finds Den Protector, which wow. is just perfect. Remember, there's a Death Mist Raptor in the graveyard to go along with it. And that can get back that summary dismissal if need be. Oh no, the summary dismissal was, oh, it countered the transgress, so it's not exiled. Oh yeah, yep, that's right. Animate Lumbering Falls and attack with Den Protector, Elvish Visionary, and Lumbering Falls. Such, His, a, such a tight game here. Yeah. Hissing Quagmire is going to take down a Lumbering Falls. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. The, now everything was attacking him, not attacking Nyssa here. And this drops Solano to a very precarious life total. Uh, thought it would have been three, but but either two or three means that he's 
I think he had to take a pain from his Lanoir waist to animate his hits. Oh, uh, that's right, that's right. In either case, he's he's uh, being threatened by three lethal attackers here, the two Den Protectors and the Lumbering Falls, and actually the Death Miss Yeah, Death Miss Raptor's going to come back from the graveyard. So he's going to need a big turn. Here's Tireless Tracker. I think this is going to be it if, if Lingelbach decides to go for the kill here. <clears throat> and passes the turn back to Cody. Oh, we're, we're in extra turns, by the way. Oh, wow. So time, time has elapsed in the round. You see that, uh, that die. So this is turn one of five turns. Animate <laughs> Lumbering Falls <laughs> and Cody Lingleback and the Blue Green Crush deck go to 9 1 and 1 here. Wow, really impressive. Wow, that's crazy. We see that our other match is still going on here. Not sure where they are in terms of extra turns, but. And the difference here is that very fast. this is not game three. Oh, God. Since we is, is up a game, so the only way JC Tao can escape with a win here is if he somehow finds a way to win this game almost immediately, and then game three goes, goes quickly. But nope, since we actually finishes the match two to zero. Wow. And he's 11-0 uh, and 0 here. Is he our last undefeated player? I, I believe he is. I haven't, I haven't seen uh, standings yet. But impressive, and that's uh, and that's definitely the best result we've seen uh, from that from that emerge deck from the prized amalgams. A lot of those uh, had fallen out, but that's it here for round eleven on the floor.